Welcome to the November edition of the CAFE seminar. I uh, hope you're all doing well, uh, given the circumstances. Uh, so today we are very pleased that uh, Lorenzo Bretscher from uh, London Business School will present his paper entitled uh, Marking to Market uh, Corporate Debt with Peter Feldhuter, Andrew Kane, and Lucas Schmidt. Uh, we, Tony Whitehead will then give the discussion, and I would like to add that we're very thrilled that Tony has accepted to give a, a discussion in this new seminar series. Lorenzo, the screen is yours. Okay, let me... So. Thank you for joining. Thanks for organizing and giving me the opportunity to present. So as Laurent said, this is joint work with Peter from Copenhagen, Andrew from Duke and Lucas, who is an early riser in LA at <laughs> that very moment. Um, so the motivation for this paper is, and let me say that before I start, this is a very simple paper, as you will see shortly, uh, but we nevertheless hope to be able to make some progress towards answering some hopefully important question in finance, okay? So the paper evolves around corporate debt, which we think is central to both corporate finance and asset pricing. However, it is not, not very well understood. And why do we think that? Here are a few examples. So textbook finance implies a strong link between leverage and returns. However, many papers have shown this evidence, empirical evidence is rather weak. Standard models of corporate investment imply that Tobin's Q, itself a function of corporate debt, should be a sufficient statistic for corporate investment. However, what we tend to find empirically is low coefficients implying very high adjustment costs and um, you know, like significant explanatory power for cash flow measures. And there's a credit spread puzzle. So that says corporate bond spreads appear too high relative to standard model predictions. So the data spreads are too high compared to model implied spreads. The stress risk puzzle returns are negatively related to measures of financial distress, which itself is a function again of corporate debt. So the problem at, or the question at heart is really, is there a problem with theory? Should we improve on the theory we write down or is it related to measurement? And what do I mean by measurement? The theory, most often makes predictions about market values of debt, while our empirical measurement often reflects book values of debt, okay? And this paper tries exactly to fill this gap and enhance the measurement of corporate debt by using market values rather than relying on book values as is routinely done in the finance literature. So let me fast forward a bit and tell you, uh, or show you the data in three pictures, okay? So what I plot here is the firm level ratio between the market value of debt and the book value of debt. And I plot the cross-sectional dispersion across time. And what you can, what, for instance, you know, like our sample runs from 1998 all the way to 2018. And I plot in red, the median of this ratio, which if it's, close to one or actually one, then measurement shouldn't be an issue. However, if it's far away from one, then that is indicative of market values being very different from book values, right? So the median is in red, and then I have two sets of confidence bands. So the main takeaways are as follows in a, you know, like in times of financial distress, such as the financial crisis, you see that market values seems to be very different from book values, even for the median firm or for the median firm in our sample. Moreover, after in the aftermath of the financial crisis, market values tend to be higher than book values. Why is that? Because that's the, uh, the period of the zero lower bound. And we have like many fixed rate coupon bonds that then trade up way above par. In other times of financial uh, or you know, like of, of crisis, sector specific crisis, such as the dot com uh, bubble burst, we see that the confidence bands widen, but not necessarily uh, the median is affected, right? Okay, this, um, this statement that market values seem to be very different empirically than the book values of the corporate debt becomes even more strong uh, when we 
look at subsamples. And what I plot you here on the left is the subsample of low rating firms, that is below investment grade firms. And on the right is are the investment grade firms, okay? So just by comparing the scales of these two pictures, you see that the movements on the left-hand side for the non-investment, below investment grade firms is, are much more erratic, okay? However, for, even for the highly rated firms, you see that the zero lower bond phase leads to substantial deviations and also the financial crisis of market values from book values. Okay, so that's sort of the variation that we are uh, that we are going to exploit in our paper or talk about in our paper. So, in case I I don't manage to finish, let me preview some of the main findings. We compile a comprehensive data set on monthly rather than quarterly as a standard book and market values of corporate debt at the firm level. We document significant differences between market and book values as we just see, especially for distressed firms or low rated firms. And we provide novel rules of sum regarding debt adjustment based on standard data sources. And then we sort of have a few or a battery of, of empirical applications. And what we find that once we calibrate to market values of debt, standard credit risk models fit credit spreads remarkably well. And at least in our sample period, we find no evidence of a credit spread puzzle, okay? Using market-based measures of Tobin's Q, we find higher coefficients implying lower adjustment costs, better fit, and little evidence for an investment cash flow sensitivity. Uh, what, once we use market values, we're better able to, um, to predict uh, bankruptcies or corporate default. And then we can also study risk premia aspects of our sample. We find that once we sort on market leverage, we find significant return spread spreads giving rise to um, leverage premium. Once you control for market leverage, we find moreover little evidence for a value premium to be left. And last but not least, a debt-based measure of financial distress is positively rather than negatively related to excess returns and premium. Okay. So before I get to the data, uh, let's sort of further motivate what we're gonna do in our paper empirically through the lens of a very basic uh, model, okay? And this is a Leland 1994 model of dynamic capital structure. So where we have that the firm's productivity, XT evolves exogenously as a geometric Brownian motion. The firm issues debt, why? Because it wants to shield profits from taxation, though there's a debt tax shield. And it issues a defaultable console bond with the coupon C and the face value F, which is also equal to the book value of debt in this model. And the market value of debt, uh, BT, is then time va varying and reflects the moneyness of the option to default, okay? So that is the market to book debt ratio BT over F or the counterpart of what I plotted you before in this model is endogenously time varying. And here is, are some simulations of this model, okay? What I plot on the top left graph is the market leverage in blue, okay? The blue solid line versus the quasi market leverage. And whenever I say quasi market leverage, I refer to the leverage where we use the book value of that rather than market value of that in our leverage definition in red dashed lines. And you can see that around months or periods 20 to 40 and around 100, they're significantly different from each other. Once you take the ratio between these two lines, you would get something like this. Again, time varying and potentially very different from one. The same is true if you plot market to book debt ratio in this model or in this simulation. You can also calculate Q versus quasi Q in this uh, simple model. And here again, you see that market-based Q is not always exactly the same as book value debt-based Q, okay? So what, what do we do in terms of data? Okay, we combine several data sources in order to construct our sample, 
Okay, so the firm balance sheet information is very standard. It's CompuStat, both quarterly and annual. We have share price information from CRISP, which is obviously monthly. And then we have corporate bond information. And here we need pricing information and static information. The static information comes from FISD, again, very standard. So that's items such as time, uh, you know, maturity date and so on and so forth. Uh, the pricing comes from uh, transaction uh, level data, okay? So in the earlier part of the sample, we used the Lehman Fixed Income Database. And from July, July 2002 uh, onwards, we used the WRDS Bond Returns Database, which is essentially uh, a cleaned version of Trace, okay? Then we have corporate loan information, again, pricing information and static information. The static information is fairly well known, which is the WRDS Reuters Steel Scan database. And for the pricing, we use uh, transaction uh, data from the secondary loan markets. And this is the LPC market to market uh, database issued by Thomson Reuters as well. Once we put all this data together, we wanna to know what is the intensive to some extent and extensive margin of our sample coverage. So what I mean by intensive margin is really within a firm, if we look at the book value from quarterly CompuStat, what fraction of this book value do we have market values for, okay? And the answer is on average 82%. All right, so for 82% of the book value from quarterly CompuStat, we can attach market prices to it, okay? And this comes in market prices from two sources, as we already said, one source is uh, bond prices, and this is roughly 59% on average, and then we have loan uh, prices, loan transaction level data. This is accounting for roughly 30% of the book value in CompuStat. Now that's sort of within a firm. Now we wanna not say something about whether our sample is representative uh, with respect to the CRISP CompuStat universe. What I tabulate here is for each year, we have the number of firms and we have the number of bankruptcies. That's just uh, for, for your interest. And then we have like a variable called percentage coverage Percentage coverage is the sum in a given year of total liabilities in our sample for all our sample firms divided by the sum of total liabilities in the CRISP CompuStat universe, okay? So to the extent that we wanna say something about debt, corporate debt, this Percentage coverage tells you that on average, our sample can speak to 77.1% of corporate debt that is out there based on the CRISP CompuStat universe, okay? That obviously doesn't include um, privately held companies. So to that extent, we feel, you know, to the extent that we wanna make statements about debt, we feel that this is a fairly representative sample. Now, let me, start by showing you some plots about capital structure implications. So the usual best practice quasi-market leverage is you use book values of debt from at the quarterly frequency from CompuStat and you combine it with monthly equity values, market values, right? Now we um, improve this measure or augment this measure in two, along two dimensions. The first one is we improve or we, we increase the sampling frequency from quarterly to monthly. So from going from the first line to the second equation, we essentially just in blue is what is, is highlighted what changes, right? We, we just um, swap the book values of that from quarterly frequency to monthly frequency. And then from two, going from two, second equation to third equation, we actually swap the book values of debt with the market values of debt, okay? Now, if you compare the first item and, and the item on the second line, you can say something about the importance of sampling frequency. 
And if you compare two and three, you can say something about the importance of the market value versus the book values. And here are the pictures. So on the left, I plot you this ratio uh, that speaks to the sampling frequency. And we take one minus these leverage uh, definitions because quite a few firms have very low leverages. And then, uh, you know, like th these things tend to explode or uh, if, if you have very small numbers in the denominator. And so it's just a simple transformation. And what we see is that at every quarter, uh, the first and the second leverage definitions, they coincide by construction, okay? Whatever happens between the quarter is potentially due to a bond that expires in February and that would enter our database as being expired in February. Hence, it would affect the, the book value of debt in February and on going forward. However, if you use quarterly sampled uh, data, you would only detect this at the end of the next quarter, let's say end of March. Okay, so that's why you see this very high short-lived deviations, but look at the magnitude, they're fairly small, okay? And the median is essentially always one. If you look at the effect of market versus book value, uh, these deviations from one from unity are much more pronounced and also the confidence bands are much wider, okay? So that gives us evidence that the differences or the variation really comes from the differences in market versus book values and not really from uh, the change in the sampling frequency. So the first task we want to do is we want to write down rules of sum uh, for market leverage and also for asset volatility on the next slide, where we essentially uh, run regressions of book value based leverage measures uh, as a independent variables and the dependent variable is market leverage or asset volatility and we we use various polynomials so orders one to four now how do you evaluate which polynomial is the correct one we do we use two metrics the first one is in panel b we we compare the prediction error variance uh, for the various polynomials and in the case of the market leverage, this is a bit inconclusive because yes, you tend to do better once you increase n, right? The, the, the order of the polynomial, but that is to be expected. Now, the question is which n is the correct one? That's hard to say from this panel B. So that's why we also use out of sample bond pricing evidence by using a black Cox structural model and see essentially which polynomial, uh, which rule of sum can improve uh, the bond pricing performance the most, okay? For asset volatility, we run similar regressions. We don't just uh, run it on asset volatility on the left-hand side, but on the ratio between asset volatility and equity volatility. And what we find compared to previous literature, for instance, Feldhutter and Schaefer, who, who have a approach that is based on a previous paper by Stephen, we can improve on the, uh, on the prediction error variance by using polynomials in the book leverage, okay? And here it's pretty clear that we uh, should choose n equal to two because going to third or fourth order doesn't really add much or doesn't really lower the prediction error variance by much, okay? These choices of n equal to two, both for leverage and for asset volatility are also confirmed from the corporate bond pricing results. What I plot you here is the actual and modeling pride average monthly. Um, so essentially the, the, the pseudo R squares from running regression, uh, from using the black Cox model to, to derive model implied uh, time series of credit spreads and compare them with the actual spreads observed in the data. So these are all R squares, pseudo R squares. If you have no leverage adjustment, um, you, you get an R, R square of an average of roughly 60%. If you use our rule of sum to improve on uh, 
your input for um, asset volatility, you can boost this R square by roughly 5% or 2.3 percentage points, okay? Once you also take adjust for the leverage, the market leverage, you improve modestly, but you still improve your R square. The gold standard is still, if you are able to exploit our full data set, uh, so going the long way and combining all these data sources, you would be able to get an R square of roughly 66%. If you study the results closely, the action is coming mostly from the low rate of bonds. Having this framework in place, we can also revisit the credit spread puzzle. And we're, our paper is very similar in spirit and idea to a recent JFE paper by, by Goldstein and Yang. Their argument is, okay, we should use market values of debt to evaluate uh, structural bond pricing models and revisit the credit spread puzzle. What they do then is they look at market to book adjustment factors estimated on bond prices only for various rating uh, categories, okay? AAA, AA, and so on and so forth. And here is the numbers, these adjustment factors from their paper. Now, when we use just bond price information and redo what they did on our sample, which is slightly different to theirs, right? We get numbers that are very close to their numbers. Notably, the AAA category is way above one, the adjustment factor also for, for the AA. And for the very low rate of bonds, you have a factor that is very, uh, very um, far, far below one, below unity. Once you use all bond and bank debt information, so you exploit our sample, our database, you would get values, adjustment factors that are much closer to one, okay, across the board. Why is that? At least for two reasons. Bank debt has substantially higher recovery rates and bank debt on average has lower duration. Hence, bank debt is less, um, you know, like, um, elastic or like sensitive to changes in credit risk and also interest rate risk, right? And so that's why these, these um, factors are closer to unity in our case. We then replicate their results. They're perfectly there. So they would conclude that in six out of seven rating categories, credit spreads are significantly as indicated by the stars, lower compared to the actual data. Once you use our market value uh, rating adjusted leverage, so using all bond and bank debt information, this credit spread puzzle starts to vanish, okay? Only two out of seven categories are now significantly lower than um, the data. If you further improve using rules of sum or in essentially the best case, the correct leverage and asset wall uh, or the correct, I mean, like the, the ones that we measure in our in our sample, you get very close to the data, okay, in terms of credit spreads, and you see almost no, except in one case for the double A category, um, differences, significant differences compared to the actual spreads. Okay, so once we have the data in place, we can also easily calculate asset returns just using market value-based capital structure weights and debt returns and compare them to unlevered equity returns, which is routinely used in, in many papers to gauge the business risk or, or, or essentially proxy asset returns, right? Asset risk. So what we do, what I do here is essentially I, I plot you the difference in terms of box plots in percentages, right? between asset returns and unlevered equity returns for various ways of unlevering. Top left is the usual way. You use, um, you use just book debt to unlever. Top right, you use the Merton model uh, to calculate the, book, uh, the market value of debt and then you unlever. Down here, we use our actual market leverage and Last but not least, we use the rule of sum one in order to predict actual market leverage and then use that one to unlever. So there are two messages that arise. The first one is 
um, you know, unlevering equity returns um, is not as straightforward as one might think and can lead to significant biases in measuring business risk, right? If you use traditional ways of unlevering, even if you use the Merton model, you tend to do okay-ish for the investment grade uh, sample, but not so great for the below investment grade. If you use market data, uh, then you actually do pretty a pretty good job for investment grade firms, but still you miss out or there's still quite stark differences for the non-investment companies, which makes sense, right? Because if you use this uh, equation to unlever, you effectively assume a beta of debt to be equal to zero. So that is, you assume that debt is risk-free, which is a horrible assumption for these low rated firms, okay? So if, I guess one conclusion could be that any statement about unlevered equity returns is at best a statement about investment grade companies. Okay. Now let me switch gears and think about corporate investment. Uh, benchmark model is Hayashi's Q theory of investment. And there is the key theoretical prediction is that Tobin's Q is a sufficient statistic for corporate investment rates, obviously under some assumptions. But the key empirical findings are it's not quite the case, right? There's this investment cash flow sensitivity, and the, low, the, the coefficients on Q are quite low, and R squared is significantly far away from one. Uh, so you can either fix the theory, and there have been many very valuable attempts to do that. What we do is different. We try to improve on the measurement of Tobin's Q by using market values of debt which enters in the valuation of the firm up here. So blue is usually what changes, right? So we have the market value of debt. For investment rates, we don't do much. We use both the traditional Q as has been used by Tony and uh, other papers uh, in previous work. And on also we, we study total Q, which is a great pa recent paper by Peterson Taylor that essentially expands on traditional Q by also incorporating intangibles, okay? And then we have various investment rates, the traditional one, fiscal investment, we can study intangible or total investment, okay? Which is fiscal plus intangible investment. What we find here in that standard OLS results is that once you use this, so this is total Q and this is total Q in market values, right? Using market values. Once you use the market values, coefficients are larger, okay? For every investment rate uh, you can think of. And also the differences in R square and note this is within R square are uh, positive and statistically significant. So we can inc increase R square up to 14%. Uh, by using market values rather than book values of debt. Now, this is, these are the OLS results, but uh, the true unobserved Q is still measured with error. One um, source of error could be that we measure average rather than marginal Q. So the standard OLS coefficient suffer from measurement error bias. So what, what we do to address this, we use um, the, higher order cumulant estimated by Ericsson, Shang and Whitehead, okay? So it's essentially this errors in variable model where the first equation relates investment to the unobservable Q, right? That's unobservable and this is investment. And P is our proxy and the second equation determines how well our proxy measures unobserved Q, okay? And here are the results. So rho square and tau square are the variables of interest in this table. So rho square measures how well the true unobservable Q explains investment, sort of the R square, if you wish, of the first equation on the previous slide, and tau square is the R square of the second equation, measures how well our Q proxy explains the true Q. If you compare book values with market value Q, you see that both for total Q and traditional Q, by the way, um, both rho square and tau square 
uh, improve, okay? Which we take as an evidence that, you know, like we're able to reduce uh, the measurement error in the first place and hence improve on these numbers here. Uh, we can then also correct for cash flows. And this is the total cash flows here. If we do this in the, in this, in the context of total Q and total investment, we find no significance, uh, uh, no significant coefficient, actually mildly negative, the point estimate on cash flows, total cash flows. If we do it for physical investment only and using traditional Q, we, even though when we use market values uh, to calculate traditional Q, cash flows are still significant, but the point estimates is lower and the statistical significance goes down. Okay, so uh, the, the direction is, is a good one if you, if you want to conclude that way for both Qs. For total Q, the results are a bit stronger than for uh, traditional Q and physical investment. Having market values of debt, we can form this market, market value of debt to book value of debt, or like a debt value variable, if you wish, um, which is a firm level proxy for bond Q. Um, thanks, Loho. Uh, and bond Q was introduced by uh, Thomas Philippon in his QCE paper, and he shows that bond market information has. Uh, and the, therefore the bond Q is a very powerful version of Q that uh, at the aggregate level uh, explains aggregate investment, not only in levels, but also in changes, okay? So we try to exploit our data along this dimension and say, look, we're able to calculate a firm level proxy of bond Q. So let's test it and see whether it has something to say about investment. It turns out it, it, it enters a statistically significant way and also with the right sign. So there is a relationship between investment, whether it's physical or intangible or total and firm level bond Q. We then dissect these results a bit. And once we split the sample into investment grade on the upper part and non-investment grade, so low rating firms in the lower part of this table, we find that these results are predominantly coming from low rating firms, which makes sense. That's where this bond Q is, has most variation, okay? Now, one of the points in Philippon's paper was that bond Q also has power for changes in investment. Uh, and change in investment are, are, are usually very hard for uh, traditional Q measures to explain. So we also try to explain um, changes in measurement by using our firm level proxy of bond Q. And the results are similar to the ones before. Indeed, for low rating firms, uh, bond Q, firm level bond Q has actually significant both economically and statistically significant power at in explaining changes in investment, okay? Whereas Q, traditional Q measures perform very poorly, both for investment grade firms and also for low rating firms. The next application is about default risk and the value of debt. We do the following, we, we, we take, um, existing predictive variables such as uh, naive K KMV from Barat Baras and Shumbe and enrich this with market value, value uh, information for, for debt, okay? And also we can actually measure asset volatility directly. So we exploit this in our KMV market value uh, based uh, measure. We then also um, use um, our data to improve upon the measurement of a distant to default measure from Atkinson, uh, Eisfeld and Weil. And that is based on the Merton model because we can actually uh, measure the asset 
the, the market value of assets, the market value of debt, and also asset volatility directly, okay? Once we do this, we compare them to their book value counterparts. So whenever you see KMV without anything, that's the book value version, KMV, MV is the market value version, okay? And we see that they are correlated, book and market value, uh, market value based, based um, variables, but not perfectly, okay? which gives us some hope that there's some interesting variation we can exploit. In addition, we, uh, we think again hard about the market to book debt variable. So the ratio between market value debt and book value debt, because whenever this ratio is low, that should uh, be indicative of financial distress going forward, because that means the the debt portion of this firm is valued at a very low price. Interestingly enough, this variable is very low in correlation with other predictors. So this gives us some hope that maybe this predictor variable contains information above and beyond the information encoded in existing predictors, okay? So the first step is at horizons of one quarter, four quarters, and eight quarters to see whether market values, swapping book values for market values have, have lead to some improvements. Indeed they do. Um, we can um, improve on R squares up to 76% in our best specification. And importantly, also the market to book debt variable uh, predicts default across all horizons with the correct sign, okay? So that leads us to our second application, which then says, okay, given the low correlation between existing predictors and market to book debt, let's add them together in a regression and see whether we can improve. Yes, we can. It keeps it significant. And the log likelihood uh, ratio test tells us that yes, indeed, we should keep both variables and not uh, look at the restricted model, okay? So adding market to book debt seems to have explanatory power above and beyond these um, um, traditional predictor variables for corporate default. Again, this statement holds at one quarter, one year, and two years. Okay, now in the last four minutes, I wanna talk a bit about risk and leverage or uh, risk in corporate debt. This is Modigliani-Miller relationship between the return on equity and return on assets. We already talked about it, about this formula when comparing asset returns with unlevered equity returns. The key theoretical prediction is returns are monotonically increasing in leverage. The key empirical findings is there's a weak empirical relationship and Lucas and Schwao have worked on this. There are fixes in terms of theory, leverage is endogenous. Again, we come from the other way and we think about measurement and not about fixing the theory. And here's what we get from sorting on market leverage. These are excess returns, equity, debt, loans, bonds, and assets. So these are somewhat nonlinear sorts. So we have like the 5% lowest uh, leverage firms uh, in this very left bucket and the 5% highest in the very right bucket. And then we have uh, 15 or 20% um, um, shares of, the pop of our sample here. So the long short strategy 2080 tells you essentially what is the spread being agnostic about the very tail of these, um, of these sorts. And here you would see that uh, even in this more conservative uh, spreads, uh, there is a significant uh, spread in equity returns and also bond returns, not in asset returns. That's not what you would expect. Hence, there seems to be evidence for a leverage premium, or uh, at least leverage seems to be a sorting variable. If we do double sorts on market leverage and book to market equity, 
we find that along the leverage dimension, which is the horizontal dimension, there is some significance, at, and at least in our sample, even though the right sign, HML, is not statistically significant, okay? So there's little evidence for a value premium after controlling for market leverage, which is in line with uh, this paper by Doshi, a recent paper by Doshi and all in the JF. We then also look at market to debt, uh, market to book debt sorts. So that's our new predictor, if you wish, of, of financial distress. And we find that low market to book debt ratio, hence a low valuation of your debt vis-a-vis -vis its book or par value is associated with high excess equity returns. That is returns are positively related to excess returns are positively related uh, to financial distress. I have one minute to conclude, so right on spot. So we compiled this comprehensive data set that offers us a playground uh, to revisit uh, some key results in the finance literature. We find that market values are at, at least at times and for some uh, sectors in our sample, they, or some firms in our sample, very different compared to book values, which gives us enough power to find interesting results in our, uh, in our empirical applications and that these results relate to Tobin's Q, but also uh, bankruptcy predictions, risk premia, and the credit spread puzzle. So let me conclude by saying, we think that measurement goes a long way. And even though this is a very simple, at heart, this paper, we think we have some, or we hope we have something to say about uh, many aspects of the financial, of the literature in, in finance. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Lorenzo, for a very interesting presentation. So the discussion is Tony White. So thanks very much for having me to discuss this paper. It was a ton of fun to read. Um, let me get started. So this is a paper about measurement. And I actually think it offers a marvelous job of measuring the market value of debt. This is something I've been interested in since I wrote my dissertation back when there wasn't great data and we came up with these elaborate algorithms to change the market, the book value of debt into the market value of debt. But this is much better. They just have great data. And so their measure tracks the book value of debt more closely for firms outside of financial distress and less closely for firms inside of financial distress, which makes a ton of sense and which is what you'd hope would happen. So I think they contain, there's a lot of results in the paper. I think there's like 20 odd tables, but I think it contains three main results. So they use their market value of debt measure and they get a better measure of Tobin's Q and they find very little evidence of investment cash flow sensitivity. Their measure improves the prediction of default and they find a leverage premium. So that's the, the, distress, the, the distress puzzle. But they also find no volume premium after they control for market leverage. So they've got a corporate finance result, they've got a fixed income result, and they've got an asset pricing result. I think the organization of the paper is a bit fractured. So they start with this simple real options model with defaultable debt. And then there's this careful and really nice explanation of the data and the measurement. And then there are these investment cash flow results there, and there's no reference to the model. And there are the default results with, with reference to the model because these Leland models really are where the default literature comes from. And then the asset pricing results without reference to the model. So the paper's sort of all over the place. But yet there's a lot of really good stuff in the paper. And so what I was thinking when I was reading the paper is how would you take some kind of nice unifying framework <laughs> where you could get all of the results, the corporate finance results, the fixed income results, the asset pricing results, and put them under one umbrella so that it would be a nice paper with a uh, unifying theoretical background. So what I wanna do in this discussion is two things. I wanna explain why the current model is too stylized. 
they, they admit it up front, super stylized model. But I think it's a little too, I, and I'm all for simple models, but it's too stylized. And then I want to outline a model that might be able to nest all of the interesting facts. So first, let me talk about the real options model. It's really simple. So you've got a stochastic decreasing returns technology of capital. Fine. And you've got an idiosyncratic technology shock that's a Brownian motion. Okay, so this is kind of like the Leland um, EBIT generating machine where, except you have, it's a function of capital, but you've got this stochastic process that's generating EBIT. And then that this is the part that's a little that incorporates the idea of investment that takes it one step beyond a straight Leland model is the firm has a one shot option to invest in capital. And at that time, it exercises its option. So now we're into these, these Erwan Moralek models. Um, the firm can restructure its debt, but only at that time. And then the lovely thing about these models is you can do the value matching conditions and the smooth pasting conditions, and you get these really, really nice PDEs to solve. So that's great. And he already showed these to you, but he's, they show that in the model, market leverage and quasi-market leverage diverge, which is fine. But if you take a look at them, there's my little footnote there. They're pretty highly correlated, which struck me as odd because a lot of the factoids that they're interested in are regression factoids and regression factoids are all about correlations. So, what can this framework address? Investment cash flow sensitivity? No, don't think really, because there are no real financial frictions in the model. The, the, um, there are a bunch of deep pocket investors behind the firm. But more importantly, there's no ongoing investment to co-vary with anything. And so it's hard to think about a covariance in the model with a one-time investment option. What about the default predictions? Well, yes, that's it's per, that their model that their that simple little model works. But then, you know, yeah, but I'm going to talk about why I think that that should not be a focus of the paper. So yes, but let me just get to that in a little bit. And then, what about the asset pricing results? Well, there's no pricing kernel, so there's no sense in which there's going to be any reasonable thing like a return spread in the model without a pricing kernel. So what I want to do with the rest of the discussion is outline what I think would be a better framework. And I'm very well aware that one of the co-authors at least knows how to code this up. And, and we all know who that is. Um, and I, then, and I th I'm going to explain why I think that that would provide a nice overarching theoretical framework that would bind this these fairly disparate results together in a way that would make for a more cohesive paper. So here we go. So I'm going to make it as simple as possible. I will try to um, add little, a little bit of commentary here and there about where the authors might be able to add a little bit more detail if they thought that was important. So I'm just going to talk about a discrete time infinite horizon model of a firm. If you wanted to make a GE, that would be fine, but I'm just going to go simple. Um, the firm maximizes the present value of distributions to shareholders. There's a stochastic decreasing returns technology that uses capital. So in that case, this model and their model are identical. It's almost the same technology except there's in the model I'm gonna talk about, there's ongoing capital investment. And that's going to be important because you want to have investment that co-varies with something. And then some financing options with frictions. And you need the frictions because in the investment cash flow sensitivity literature, it's all about frictions. Without frictions, okay. So a super, super standard production technology. I, I want some fixed costs. Those of you who are in the know about this class of models know that unless you put fixed costs in there, the firms don't default enough and you don't get good credit spreads. So you need some fixed costs. 
And then I want a stochastic profit function of capital. So we have Z, X, K to the alpha. Alpha is between zero and one. Z is an idiosyncratic shock and X is an aggregate shock. So the idiosyncratic shock follows an AR1 in logs. This is pretty standard. So a prime is tomorrow, no prime is today. Rho is a serial correlation coefficient. And this epsilon thing O is a normal innovation, fine. Let's make the aggregate shock simple. We'll just do high and low. You can make, you, that would, that's easy to fix. I was, um, that I was just going off of code on my hard drive and that's what I had code for, so that's what I did. So just simple high and low. And then investment is tomorrow's capital stock minus the depreciated value of, delta is the depreciation rate, today's capital stock. So we've got very, very, very standard technology relative to say a, like a Q model. The differences from a Q model are decreasing returns. That just makes it easier to solve. The aggregate shock, that's gonna be important for the asset pricing. We've got the fixed costs. That's important for getting this crazy firms to default every so often. And the rest is pretty standard. So the, I'm going to make this model super simple because I'm a discussant. I can do what I want. It doesn't matter. I'm not try, the one who's trying to deal with referees. So there are profits. So that's the profit function. So that's idiosyncratic shock, aggregate shock, capital to the alpha less than one minus the fixed costs. And then I have a model with one period risky debt. I'm guessing you would do a better job with multi-period risky debt, but I'm just gonna, I, like I said, I'm gonna discuss it. I'm gonna do one period risky debt that's repaid when debt matures. So it gets rolled over every period. Something else you could do is something like a straightforward Leland and Toft like um, structure where you had that um, the debt, debt um, depreciate geometrically, that'd be straightforward. So negative B indicates cash. Default occurs when firm value falls below zero. So the firm can, ha can raise old debt to repay new debt up to a point where it's no longer optimal. And then the price of debt, which in these models is usually Q and I couldn't use Q twice because that would be ridiculous. So the price called it P is determined by shocks, the firm's current period decisions and then make equity issuance go away because it sort of doesn't matter in these models anyway. Well. That's not, so what would this model give you so far? It would give you default predictions and it would give you investment cash flow predictions. And there's a difference between book debt B and market debt P. So that's, so you've got everything except for one thing. Here's, there's no asset pricing implications because there's no pricing kernel. So you could just have expected returns vary with X. And so the conditional expected return is B times some function M of today and tomorrow's shock. And then you could say that the time varying returns function is a function of current and future X. I don't know, this, is, this would work. Just have that be a function of the difference between tomorrow's X and today's X. The important thing is you want investors to value assets that pay off in bad states. So you'd want M1 to be less than zero. Okay, we've got it all. The one thing I want to, to, to close this little model sketch with is the pricing of debt and the, and the Bellman equation. So value function is just, the firm value is the maximum of zero and it's continuation value if that happens to be above zero. If the value drops below zero, the firm defaults. And so the Bellman equation is just the value as a function of the idiosyncratic shock, the aggregate shock, capital, book debt, and they get to choose investment and tomorrow's debt. And then D is the distributions. And then that's the discounted continuation value where we're discounting using the pricing kernel. Subject to what are dividends, their profits, pay the fixed cost, you raise money with new debt, which is priced fairly at a price P, which I'll get to, minus B, which is old debt. You have to prepay your old debt every period, minus investment. 
and dividends have to be positive. Where does this P thing come from? It's just a, it's just a fair pricing equation. So in the event of default, the lender gets to keep a fraction of the capital. And then the lender provides a state contingent contract that compensates for the loss in case of default. And so the price is just the expected value of the probability of solvency, blue, times what you get in solvency, the face value, times the probability of default, times what you get in default, the recoverable value of capital. That's it, that's the model. So just to recall, what if we've got, we've got everything now. So we can get the investment cash flow sensitivity results because we've got investment, we've got cash flow, they vary. We just got to get them to vary together or not, depending on we've got the market value of debt and the book value of debt because we've got endogenous default. So we've got that. We've got default, so we can predict default. And we've got a pricing kernel so we can get returns results. Okay, so now I think, and I, I know that one of the co-authors whose name starts with an L might be able to code this up. So how would this res relate to the three results in the model? So how does it relate to investment cash flow sensitivity? So I've put up what Lorenzo put up, except instead of symbols, I just have words. So investment is equal to true Q times beta plus cash flow times alpha plus a regressionary U. And then observed Q is equal to true Q plus epsilon. This tau squared thing that he was talking about is actually the R squared of the measurement equation. So it's this business here. So, and that's interesting because that's just, if you think about it, that's just an index of measurement quality. If it's zero, you have a lousy proxy, utterly worthless proxy. And if it's one, you have a perfect proxy and then it can go in between. And the cash flow coefficient is decreasing in the R squared of the measurement equation. So the better the R squared, the lower the cash flow coefficient, the way the regression is typically set up. And then estimate measurement quality. We've been, my co-author Tim Erickson and I have been doing this forever. We um, figured out a nice closed form way to do it in 2014. And this is what I think the authors should do. They've already done half of it, which is steps one and two. And the actual data with the usual Q and the actual data with the improved Q measure measurement quality, because it's easy, it comes right out of there. But then do the same thing in the simulated data to see if you can get something that's quantitative similar. It, what, would it make sense that switching from market to book debt would give you the same improvement in measurement quality and the same lowering of the cash flow coefficient? So I think that would be pretty interesting. The other thing it would do, it would give you a nice economic interpretation to a source of measurement error which I think is nice because the one thing that um, has certainly been true of all this stuff I've been doing with measurement error over the years is just correcting for measurement error doesn't tell where it comes from. It's an econometric fix and it's a, if you believe the assumptions, it really is a fix, but it doesn't go back to the underlying economics. And so I think that doing something like this and tying it to book versus market debt in a model would be great. Okay, we've got result one down. Now I'll talk about result two. This is the Yabat result. In the model, the price of debt falls as the firm nears default. That's pretty straightforward. But on some level, it's kind of, you know, yeah, duh, of course that makes sense. Shouldn't market debt predict default better than book debt because markets know that the firm's gonna default? So that makes sense. I would think of this default prediction result as a reality check rather than a major result, but that's just, that's just a free disposal comment from a discussant, but I, I, it strikes me that a referee would say, yeah, duh, to something like that. And I think if you just couched it as being a reality check, then I think that it would be a much more persuasive part of the paper. Oh, this is the part where I'm gonna punt a little bit because I'm not an asset pricing person. I can only co-author asset pricing papers with asset pricers. But 
I'm pretty sure the, at least I did a sip, I coded up a model and, and let it run for a bit. And it looks like the following is true. The model with market debt can replicate your bond rep results. And it, I think it can re replicate your equity sorting results. And in general, would you be able to put an economic interpretation on substituting in market for book debt with your asset pricing results? And then I think you've got it. You've got one model, you've got three utterly disparate results, but you've put them under a nice unifying framework. You'll notice that I didn't question any of the empirical results. They're there, they're fine. The, the measurement part of the paper is awesome. No, no complaints there at all. I just think it needs a better theoretical framework. So I think I'm done on time. So great measurement, interesting empirical results. I just think it needs a better unifying framework to make all of these like all over the place results tie together better. Thank you, Tony, for really detailed discussion. Uh, Lorenzo, would you like to reply? Uh, yes, so first of all, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, I think that was a great discussion. It helps us to uh, certainly reorganize our thinking and also, you know, I agree there are currently many results floating around. I guess we got excited uh, at looking at the data and that's sort of the result of this um, process. But uh, so that's, that's why it's great to have you as an outside observer and to reorganize our team essentially. But uh, so let me be a bit more specific. I, I, I like the way you think about the results, so corporate finance result, fixed income results, asset pricing result. So I, I think it's well put and we should probably incorporate this in our uh, narrative and line of thinking. Um, then your, uh, I guess, suggestion of like having this umbrella with one unified theory, even though, uh, even though they, also this theory will take some shortcuts here and there, it would be great, I agree. Uh, it would allow us in particular to deal with the economic interpretation of the results or the sources. And I, I think one could go down two routes there. One is your route, like to have this overarching uh, theory, or we would have to dig much deeper into the nitty gritty details of all these uh, empirical results and make it purely empirical. Now, given, I guess, our our tendency in our cause or team and um, you know like there are two L's so you know there, there's still some uh, you know dispense of who you meant but I, I, I no, think the, the, other, this, the this, other L the, the, it's this, the other L because I, I, I know I know I know I know, know just joking know the other L. Yeah, yeah. no no exactly <laughs> I, I just wanted to resolve it so the second letter is you <laughs> uh, but a, in any case um, so I think we're very much on your uh, in your corner in in a sense of writing down some some more sort more theory and the rich, or or you know like overarch the paper the empirics that way. Uh, now your comment about the reality check, yes, well taken. I think that's what we had in mind. We I maybe I over pushed it a bit. I didn't mean to do so in the presentation. I think the only result that we have there or like the, the result that I think is interesting in this section is this market to book debt variable that we put forward, which I saw this sort of cool, but um, because it has this common theme, it, it pops up here and there and it adds value uh, to, to various results. You know, it's also the bond Q proxy. So it has sort of a, a nice counterpart with the value equity book bar, uh, market to book ratio as well. So that's why I sort of I uh, was keen on, on, on putting that there. But um, yes, that should be a reality check. And it's very, but you know, to some extent it, it calmed my nerves, right? Because it, it, it's nice to have this yeah. increase in R squared, right? So, so it seems to make sense, which is great, yeah. But thanks for a great discussion and for the input, yeah, thanks. So maybe I'll ask a question. So Lorenzo, has yeah. nobody compared book value and market value for these? implications are you the first uh to my knowledge yes at least the way we we do it right like there are some people uh there 
a few papers that sort of think about like using market values of debt, but then they they, they think about returns or they 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 never really do the, the comparison the way we do it. And moreover, no one has, to my knowledge, the best of my knowledge, combined bond debt and loan bank loans in one paper. So there's no no data set like ours, I think. But you know, that's just yeah, to the best of my knowledge. Yes. Very good. So may I ask what 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 are the next steps? And then if you have a you have a, a really like powerful way of measuring that, it seems that you could do you could do a lot more, no? No, exactly. I, I think um, I, I think you're right. Uh, um, that's also a, maybe as Tony has witnessed it, sort of manifested a bit in this paper, right? Because we started mm -hmm. to run off in different directions. Because then you get excited and uh, and and you start thinking about things. Uh, I think there's much more to be done also along the margin about. Uh, for instance, thinking about the composition of debt, and there must be trade-offs there. Now, there's there's another margin where one could think deeper about uh, debt, because there's also a fraction we cannot capture, even for publicly traded firms, which is private place debt. Now, to some extent, in my simple mind, it says like there must be a trade-off, right? Whether you want to go for private placements or not and what are these trade-offs now it turns out there is some data on private placements which we're currently uh, also in the process of of of, of getting uh, now there's a bit harder to have market values but that's you know like it's in the realm of of this of this right side of the life uh, of the balance sheet if you wish if you on the liability side we certainly want to explore this more and i mean there you know, uh, I think there there's more AP questions to be answered and certainly more corporate finance questions, you know, like where are these debt overhang problems most prominent, you know, uh, how does market values uh, potentially play an important role there, you know, like what, what is the cyclicality of leverage, because what what you tend to see that the cyclicality of book leverage and market leverage are so, is somewhat different for subsamples, right? When the market value drops dramatically uh, of the debt portion, actually market leverage is way below book leverage in the crisis, right? So uh, this, you know, I, I think I can think of many applications. I I don't have one particular very, you know, final. Um, application or idea that I, I can share with you right now. But uh, yeah, I think oh, there's, it's, it's an interesting oh, okay. playground. Yes, I agree. Yes, um, we have. Thank you. Yes, that's, I think it's a it's a whole new area, a new, whole new field that you can open up this way. Uh, Abraham Liu is asking if you're controlling for liquidity. Um, no. Uh, so for now, I, I agree. So the, these bonds are not equally liquid. Now, what we have in terms of theory that we think about, or most theories, they're, they're, you know, to some extent, this paper is about making progress in aligning the theoretical research and the empirical research, right? Now, um, to the extent that you have a, 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 a theory that features liquidity in there, you, the theory can actually talk about liquidity, right? And market values, controlled for liquidity. Now, then we could use our data and also control for liquidity. And there's various ways how can do this. Uh, for now, we don't do this because we, we, we don't go down this route. What we certainly could do and what we might end up doing next, even to enrich this paper is to decompose the results into what is driven by potential time varying liquidity premium discounts, right? and uh, credit risk. Another angle could be is is some of of it driven by, or I guess this goes to the heart of the question: what drives the wedge between market values and book values in the first place? Right? It could also be interest rate risk and so on and so forth. Currently, we remain silent about this. We have some anecdotal evidence that seems to say that credit risk is important. That's the split into. Uh, uh, non-investment grade and investment grade. 
but we're not going further than this. But that's certainly, a, 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 you know, like an interesting area to explore, yes. Are there other questions? Yes, Rafael, would you like to ask a yeah. question? Sure, go ahead. Hi, Lorenzo. Hey. Hello. Um, yeah, I was thinking, I mean, that the main motivation of measuring market market depth that you have uh, very well highlighted is about mispricing, if I well understood, right? So, and uh, that, that's why you, you find discrepancies uh, in particular in uh, distressed firms, right? Yeah. I was also thinking about another motivation, actually, so that, that there are many, many firms for which debt is not priced at all. Right? So uh, basically the, the, the debt items are, are not traded on the market, so that they don't have market prices. So that's basically the market value of debt, is, in that case, is completely unobservable. Um, so and then I was thinking also some kind of uh, validity test for your, for your estimation. I mean, there, there should be a paper by Davidenko um that says basically that uh, i mean that measure market value of debt or some kind of proxy of it uh, for those firms that have completely priced the debt so basically <laughs> firms that have only i mean debt only issue in terms of uh, bond or, or anyway loan that mm -hmm. are the market. so that I, mean, I was i mean i was wondering whether you can um, i mean you, you you can test maybe uh, whether your um, proxy for the market value of debt matches those firms that have priced or priced debt, and um, if your um, measure of market value of debt, how much is distant from for those firms that have not uh, priced debt, so have items of the of the debt that are not observable at all? Yes. So, so two questions, uh, two comments. Sorry. So, yes, it's very related to Davidenko. In, in fact, we we replicate some of the stuff he does in, in his appendix and we we get even in our main body of the paper we get the same results now our sample of firms where we have complete debt uh information in terms of market value is is, is obviously larger because he he only looks at bonds then he has some loans data but very little uh, and and also it's the fact that these secondary loan marks they picked up substantially uh, during our sample period. So the, the, the later in the sample, the better gets the coverage. So to the extent that we also incorporate this loan data, we have more firms for which we, we, we have a complete picture. Now, I, I'm not sure what exactly you mean by, so yes, and where we have, where we overlap, we obviously see the same prices, we confirm this. So that's that's the reality check. Then the, the other part on the non op you know, like, let's say, think, like, take my example again from privately placed debt. For this, at least in this initial period, sometimes these bonds are uh, banned from trading for two years and afterwards they can be traded and they would also enter into WRDS uh, or into trace, right? But during these two years, it's a black box. There's no market price attached to these bonds. And these bonds, they wouldn't enter our data set and that is essentially part of it is captured by these 18% in terms of book value that we miss compared to, to CompuStat. And for these 18% or for this issue of this privately placed bond or even a missing value in, in, in trades for some reason, right? We, we, we don't know. Um, we, don't, we don't assign a label at all, uh, a market price at all. We just keep it like this. In, in our most conservative estimate. And then for, we can also say, okay, um, in a more aggressive way of, 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 of doing the empirics, we could, for instance, say, let's say we, we have like 100 millions of bonds outstanding, for 90, we observe market prices, and for the remaining 10, we don't. Let's say, uh, uh, let's predict the market price based on the market prices for the same firm in the same time, um, uh, you know, like uh, based on this information and some attributes such as duration and so on and so forth, right? That's something we can do. But um, for, you know, in our main empirical exercise, we, we don't take a stand on this uh, non-observed part, yeah. Thank you. No worries. Okay, thank you very much. So we've come to the end of it was a very interesting uh, 
seminar and discussion. Um, so I think we can thank uh, Lorenzo and Tony for you know for giving us really a, a very nice uh, seminar today. Uh, the next the next uh, event is uh, on December eighth. Uh, Esther Faya uh, from Goethe University will present new results on perceptions about COVID.